Dustin Hoffman was more than a decade into his already legendary career, and Meryl Streep was still new making her mark as a presence to watch. It was the first take of their first scene together on Kramer vs. Kramer, playing a divorced couple. It was one hell of a scene to start production with on this eventual Best Picture winner. The scene was blocked and the director called action and then Dustin Hoffman slapped the shit out of Meryl Streep. This story was kept relatively secret until just a few years ago. This instance of Dustin Hoffman's extreme onset style and behavior would haunt the actor and leave Meryl Streep with marks both physical and emotional. And partly for it, both would win their first Academy Awards. But that leaves us with the question, where does the extreme method acting end and where does the, you know, freaking abuse begin? With seven Oscar nominations and even more accusations of abuse, Dustin Hoffman is one of the most unconventional, controversial, and respected talents to ever grace the silver screen. So let's find out what the f happened to Dustin Hoffman. But to truly understand what the f happened to Dustin Hoffman, we must begin at the beginning of the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. 1937, California. Dustin Hoffman was always drawn to the arts and he would ditch college and join the Pasadena Playhouse because he loved the theater. This is where he would later meet and become roommates and lifelong friends with Gene Hackman and Robert Duvall. Mr. Dusty Hoff landed his debut in The Tiger Makes Out. Madigan's Millions was officially his debut, but it didn't come out until 1968, so The Tiger Makes Out. But who remembers either of those? It was The Graduate that put Dustin Hoffman on the Hollywood map. As the story goes, Dustin Hoffman had a supporting role in The Producers, but asked Mel Brooks if he could let him go audition for another movie. And that other movie was The Graduate. Playing this confused young man, Dustin Hoffman would earn his first Best Actor nomination at the Academy Awards. But there was only so much he could do with that because soon after, he was collecting an unemployment check. You know, like a real college graduate. Dustin Hoffman really didn't know what to do with this movie career of his, and he actually started turning down a lot of movies, actually all of the movies, and decided to return back to the theater. But then two years later, after doing all that theater stuff, he showed that he had the widest range of his generation. If The Graduate was his coming out film, Midnight Cowboy would mark him as one of the best actors ever to step foot in front of a camera because you know why he's he, 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 he's walking here he's just freaking magnificent playing this raw gritty greasy con man character called Ratso Rizzo this Dustin Hoffman guy well he knew which roles were best for him and perhaps no other actor at that time was taking on stronger more diverse and challenging roles with the occasional dud here and there after all, the same year he starred in Midnight Cowboy, an X-rated Best Picture winner, he also co-headlined in the subpar movie called John and Mary with Mia Farrow. The 1970s started with the Western Little Big Man, playing a man who ages up to 121. He goes from like being a little boy or a young man, a tween maybe, to, you know, really old showing a different kind of range altogether. 1971 brought the movie Who is Harry Kellerman and Sam Peckinpah's Straw Dogs, drawing controversy over its brutal violence. And this was his most riskiest role at this point. And yes, yeah, Straw Dogs, it's a brilliant movie that's kind of hard to watch, but Dustin Hoffman's powerful, brave performance draws you in and show everyone that there was a new type of movie star in town. The old school school old Hollywood golden age classic era of a movie star was over. The new type of movie stars were weird looking dudes like this who could do interesting characters. After he did a movie called Alfredo Alfredo, he would work alongside Steve McQueen playing another very very interesting character in the epic true life prison drama Papillon. It means butterfly in French. Next came the brilliant film Lenny, 
playing controversial stand-up comedian Lenny Bruce. It's no easy feat to play someone like Lenny Bruce, and to capture the essence of this man, Dustin Hoffman would listen to hours and hours and hours and hours of his stand-up routine, LOLing the whole time. He would absolutely nail the comedian's style and mannerisms and aura, and just his spirit. He frickin' brought Lenny Bruce back from the dead. Hoffman would earn his third Best Actor nomination. In 1976, we saw him as another real-life character, Washington Post reporter Carl Bernstein, alongside Robert Redford's Woodward, watergating all over President Nixon. And I think all the President's men won Best Picture too, right? By this point, Dustin Hoffman was beating out Al Pacino for roles, arguably because of his level of commitment. And then came Marathon Man. Dustin Hoffman would give up, you know, sleeping and showering for days. Not surprisingly, though, his acting style reportedly clashed with Laurence Olivier. And we should point out Olivier's oft-quoted question, Why don't you just try acting? But apparently that Hollywood legend has been debunked. Although it sure makes sense, so you know, there's like an ecstatic truth to it. Even though it didn't really happen, we are all thinking it. Or at least Lawrence was. Cause you know, like if you put yourself through real pain for a scene, you're you're technically not acting. You're just being in in pain while they record. Or is that acting? Who knows? Comment your comment in the comments! Fight about it! Following the film's straight time in 1978, and Agatha in 1979, Dustin Hoffman landed Kramer vs. Kramer, a film about a bitter divorce. And with this, he won his first Oscar. And as you know, it would be here where he slapped Meryl Streep, you know, for the character? Something Meryl said was uh, an overstep in the acting boundaries. Violence is where Meryl draws the line. Hoffman himself was on the verge of a divorce at this time, and apparently he got so affected by this divorce thing he was going through in real life that he claims it affected his perception of his female co-stars. In addition to striking Streep, Hoffman also allegedly began acting out in other ways, using the death of Meryl Streep's former fiancé, legendary actor John Cazale, as a taunt, pushing her to leave the set. It was 1982's Tootsie that also allowed him to channel something else deep inside of him. As Michael Dorsey, or Dorothy Michaels, Hoffman presented us with more than just a cheap drag show. This cross-dressing extravaganza was actually a complex comedy, even though Dustin Hoffman never considered it a comedy. But it, you know, it, it, it's funny. But not in like a Big Mama's house way or a Miss Doubtfire way, just like in its own way. While he was being tootsified, he would immerse himself in what was meant to be not just a woman, but an unattractive woman. And years after this Tootsie movie was released, he acknowledged that if he had ever met Dorothy at a party, he wouldn't talk to her because she was ugly. Because Dustin Hoffman hates ugly people, and Mr. Hoffman would clash with director Sidney Pollack whose more conventional style of filmmaking didn't exactly mesh with Dustin Hoffman's crazy method acting ways. But despite all of this drama, Dustin Hoffman would earn his fifth Oscar nomination, and Tootsie would go down as one of the greatest comedies ever made, even though I'm sure it's probably canceled now. 1985 brought the TV movie Death of a Salesman, an Emmy-winning role that he perfected on the stage. And from there came Ishtar. Hey, even the greats have at least one Ishtar. It's a storied production that we don't really have time to get into right now, just because so much stuff happened wrongly. You know, like the ballooning budget that ended up around like $133 million inflated. Still, Dustin Hoffman maintains that he loves this mess of a movie, which makes approximately one of us. And in one of the most astounding rebounds in movie history, he would go from Ishtar to Rain Man, where he played the savant Raymond Babbitt. Brother to Tom Cruise. For the role, Dustin Hoffman did the research, and you know, everybody knows what Tropic Thunder has to say about things like this, but this was not exactly a piece of showmanship. 
as can often be the case in these kind of performances. But in Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman shows some, you know, genuine curiosity and sensitivity in this character. I don't know, at least I felt it. And the people at the Academy Awards felt it too because they gave him his second Best Actor Oscar. Then came the 90s, which brought on a pattern for Dustin Hoffman. You know, glimpses of brilliance like Dick Tracy and his guest spot on The Simpsons. And even Hook, where he was nominated for a Golden Globe but not an Oscar. But then there was also, you know, lesser but still decent stuff like Family Business, Billy Bathgate, and Hero in 1992. Launching in the middle of the decade was Outbreak in 1995, which saw a renewed interest during the pandemic. For some reason, everyone wanted to watch virus movies. He could also be found delivering fine performances in films like Sleepers, David Mamet's American Buffalo, and Mad City. But it wouldn't be until 1997's Wag the Dog. Again, another amazing script by David Mamet. In this one, Dustin Hoffman seemed fully committed, taking a seventh Oscar nomination as a Hollywood filmmaker helping the United States do a false flag war. It's an interesting little flick, actually. Doesn't have enough dogs in it, though. And by this time, it was undeniable that the Dustin Hoffman legacy and reputation and body of work could not be understated, earning the Cecil B. DeMille Award. And then two years later, he got the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award, which is weird because he still had like a lot of a lifetime left to live. And still, he was in some hits and some misses of varying magnitude including the Michael Crichton film Sphere, the Joan of Arc film The Messenger, before starting off the next century with Moonlight Mile in 2002, giving a tender performance that marks kind of a new era for him. Hoffman found a curious balance as the decade continued, playing a crime lord in confidence, which he doesn't exactly pull off, and then he finally teamed up with his former roommate slash BFF Gene Hackman in Runaway Jury, a movie that was pretty much advertised as Dustin Hoffman and Gene Hackman act together. 2004 would see him balancing nostalgic pieces like Finding Neverland, which was kind of a bit of a nod to his Captain Hook role, and he was also in quirky indies like I Heart Huckabees, and then I guess he needed a paycheck, but he tries his best in Meet the Fockers and Little Fockers. 2005 saw him voicing a pony in Racing Stripes, and again failing to succeed as a gangster in The Lost City. The next year brought some interesting supporting roles though, like Perfume and Stranger Than Fiction, contributing enough to maintain a presence in the movie-making industry, while the year 2007 saw him as Mr. Megorium in uh, Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. Hoffman would have greater success doing voiceover work like 2008's Kung Fu Panda. Then there was The Tale of Desperu, in addition to leading the film Last Chance Harvey. He did something called Barney's version in 2010, and then Hoffman landed what has become common for seasoned actors, an HBO series, uh, or what, Max, or whatever the f Unfortunately, despite potential and prestige, the series' luck was canned after one too many horses died on set. I don't think Dustin Hoffman had anything to do with it, but hey, who knows? And so Hoffman switched to behind the camera, making his directorial debut in 2012's Quartet. Yet prominent roles have continued to elude the actor, so he started taking on smaller ones like in Chef, The Cobbler, The Program, The Meyerowitz Stories, Into the Labyrinth, and 2022's Double Bill as They Made Us and Sam and Kate, which at least he made the poster for those. But the future does look strong for the 86-year-old Dustin Hoffman, who has yet another Kung Fu Panda movie coming out, because they can't stop making them. There's probably more Kung Fu Panda movies than there are actual pandas. And apparently, he's finally getting to work with Francis Ford Coppola in the unfinished epic Megalopolis, coming in 2024. But there it is, like so many actors of his generation, he has been on a decline in the quality of his movies and even his performances. 
Did Dustin Hoffman just lose interest in the art of cinema? Or did we just lose interest in Dustin Hoffman? Maybe he didn't feel challenged enough by these later characters, I, I don't know. But as it turns out, he, like so many others, was involved in the hashtag MeToo movement, but in a, in a bad way. Which may not be surprising considering, you know, part of his past. In 2017, seven women came out accusing Dustin Hoffman of sexual misconduct and assault, including teenagers. The women detailed when and how Dustin Hoffman exposed himself and made lewd advances throughout his career. In one instance, a woman working as an intern on Death of a Salesman recalled him directly sexually assaulting her in a similar manner as he did to another woman in a recording studio for Ishtar. While another instance goes back to all the president's men, Hoffman would be blasted with automatic guilt via public opinion possibly limiting his cinematic output. Regardless of the consequences, he made the following statement. I have the utmost respect for women and feel terrible that anything I might have done could have put her in an uncomfortable situation. I am sorry, it is not a reflection of who I am. And it's not, right, Dustin? With this, we think of his comments over Tootsie, when he said he would ignore women like Dorothy at a party. So what the f exactly does that mean? Was there something under his tears of confession? Was Doth protesting too much? This is just part of the complex nature of Dustin Hoffman, an unconventional looking actor who made an Oscar winning career challenging himself and those he encountered, forcing himself and others to question just what the f he could do next, on the screen, and in real life. So you know what, it's kinda okay to give a f about what the f happened to Dustin Hoffman because there's a lesson in there somewhere.